Welcome everyone to our fourth and final study and struggle critical conversation. Our event is entitled Abolition Must Be International. Huge thanks to Haymarket Books for hosting this event with us and all of their work on the back end to make this event possible. Thank you also to our captioner and our ASL interpretation services this evening. My name is Dan Berger and I will be the moderator for the evening. Study and Struggle organizes toward abolition in Mississippi through political education, mutual aid, and community organizing. Each fall, we put together a bilingual Spanish and English curriculum with discussion questions and reading materials, as well as provide financial support to more than 100 participants and radical study groups inside and outside prisons in Mississippi. And we also make the curriculum fully available online for other study groups across the country and the world to use as they see fit. Finally, we come together for online conversations like this one hosted by Haymarket Books. For our fall 2021 four month curriculum, we have borrowed and augmented slightly Ruth Wilson Gilmore's argument that abolition is about presence, not absence. It has to be green, and in order to be green, it has to be red. And in order for it to be red, it has to be international. Today, we're going to be tackling what it means for abolition to be international. And we have a truly fantastic lineup of panelists tonight. I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a moment. If you have seen previous critical conversations this fall, you will be familiar with our format. One of our panelists on the call, Felix Sittavang, is incarcerated in Washington State. Another, Jan Laman, is a former political prisoner who was released earlier this year after 37 years inside. We are so grateful that both of them were able to participate tonight via recording. We regret that Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz is not able to join us tonight as she is having a minor procedure. So we are wishing her lots of healing. And we are so very delighted and grateful to have Jaleel Muntakim and Harsha Walia with us to respond to Juan and Felix. One final thing, I want to remind those tuning in that we should have a little bit of time at the end for Q&A with our panelists. So please put questions in the chat as they come up and we'll try to ask them before the event comes to a close. To kick things off, I'm going to have our two live panelists here with us tonight introduce themselves, and then we'll hear from Felix and Jan uh, in their videos as well. So Jaleel, let's start with you. Thank you, thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, to share in this uh, momentous uh, occasion. I think it's very good that we are raising these questions of the issue of abolitionists. I'm Jalil Muta King, former member, a veteran member of the Black Panther Party and Black Liberation Army. I did nearly 50 years in prison, uh, 1971 when I was arrested to 2002, 2020 uh, when I was released on October 6, 2020. So I've been out for almost a, a year now. I am uh, the uh, co-founder of the National Jericho Movement uh, I initiated back in 1998. I'm also initiator of the most recent uh, international tribunal that was held in New York uh, City on October 22nd to the 25th that resulted in a guilty verdict of the United States having engaged in genocides against black, brown, and indigenous people. I'm an author of two books, uh, We Are on the Liberators and Escaping the Prism, P-R-I-S-M, and Fade to Black, Fading to Black. Um, and I am now a resident of Rochester, New York, and a, um, a uh, community organizer uh, for Citizen Action of New York. Thank you so much, Jaleel. It's really it's such an honor to be with you tonight. Uh, Harsha. Thank you all. Greetings. Good evening. Um, it's such an honor to be here with you, Jaleel, with all of you here today to listen from our incarcerated comrades alongside as well. Um, and just thank you to Haymarket, thank you, Dan, thank you to uh, our ASL interpreters for all your work today. Uh, my name is Harsha. I'm on the unceded, unsurrendered territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish Nations. 
These are the indigenous peoples who continue to steward and have jurisdiction on the lands that I'm speaking to you all from today. Um, and I've been a community organizer um, and also an author in migrant justice struggles, uh, and particularly organizing and thinking uh, around migrant justice through a framework of decolonization, anti-imperialism and anti-capitalism, um, and very much seeing the synergy of uh, the ways in which the border is a carceral site of governance. Detention centers and prisons are prisons of each other. And so when thinking about abolition, um, thinking about the need to dismantle all forms of carceral control, including immigration enforcement, the border itself, um, and imperialism that gives rise to forced displacement and forced migration, right? Why are people forcibly on the move? Um, why are so many people increasingly um, being displaced from their lands, from their communities, and facing multiple forms of genocide, and now, of course, vaccine apartheid on top of that? Um, so it's just such an honor to be here, um, Jalil, and to be in conversation with you, Dan, with you, and, and all of you all. So I, I very much look forward to this conversation. Thank you for hosting it and for all the good work that you all do. Great. Thank you both. Uh, now we're going to hear from uh, Felix Sittevang and Jan Lahman. To me, internationalism in practice has to begin by making forms of resistance accessible and palatable to those most impacted, right? Like those actually on the front lines. And this this actually needs to happen locally and globally. Right? Once again, academia has this habit of always needing to label something, define it, and somehow theorizing it in a way that can only be practiced almost dogmatically, right? So when we're talking about terms like uh, internationalism, abolition, gentrification, mutual aid, capitalism, right? All of these are examples of terms that um, those of us in the know are not only readily able to discuss and define, but also find ourselves defending as if like our status and reputation is dependent on us being in the know, right? Um, some sort of like academic hierarchy that buys this space in organizing circles. And like, honestly, like, I don't think frontline folk, you know, actually care about these quote unquote terms and theories, right? And um, I feel that until we're able to truly center the voices and needs of those most impacted and marginalized and ensure that these theories of struggle and resistance are not only palatable, but practical, um, they're always going to remain theories that are void of practice, right? And uh, to me, like, internationalism in practice means engaging with people in a way that not only shows how all of our issues are interconnected, but how our resistance is interdependent, right? And so is our liberation, right? To me, this is solidarity in spirit and practice, right? And this solidarity means meeting people where they're at and be willing to adapt, right, to provide people with the agency it takes to fulfill their needs and encourage them to reimagine a world where, you know, we all are valued, right? And that, you know, maybe we're able to dream a bit, you know? I became active as an activist in the, uh, in the civil rights struggle, black power struggle, and the anti-Vietnam war struggle. Uh, those are all, I mean, they were happening right here in the United States in the streets of, of, of Washington and other towns and cities all around, but they were focused on, uh, you know, what the empire, what the USA imperialism empire was doing uh, in other countries and to other peoples and nations within this country. Now, I want to, there's much more to be said about that, but I want to come to like what I think of as extremely uh, necessary to understand and um, to, uh, you know, make clear and to put forth uh, by all of us. And that's, first of all, that when we speak about internationalism within the context of us living here in the, 
you know, entity of the United States of America, it must mean, first and foremost, support for the Native people, you know, who, who, who were on this land long before, you know, European colonialists and, and, and British and French and other empires came over here and started stealing the land, stealing the resources, and, 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 and most worst of all, of course, committing genocide against all the people that were living here. I mean, there are so many, you know, native peoples and, and, and nations that are totally out of existence. I mean, 100% genocide was committed against them. So that definitely has to be, you know, the beginning part of it. Secondly, uh, well, at, at least another very similar and important thing is our understanding of and support for the Puerto Rican people for the independence of their nation. I mean, Puerto Rico, you know, is a, is, a, is a country and a people that has actually nothing to do with the United States except the United States invaded them in the late uh, 1800s and, and conquered them and took them over and it has never let them go since then. Um, the third point of, this, of these that's also extremely important for us is for us, uh, to understand and support the black liberation struggle within the United States. I mean, certainly we support, you know, struggles within Africa and so forth also, but within the United States because, um, you know, enslaved Africans brought to this place that now is called the United States of America were, uh, you know, a, a major part of the, uh, reality and the workforce that actually created what became the United States, uh, and 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 those people, enslaved people, stolen from their lands, you know, brought over here, abused and murdered and 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 and, and worked and rest of it, and then after you know the end of official slavery in this country, you know the um, the continuing, uh, um, you know. Uh, discrimination, abuse, injustice that's committed against black people, you know, I mean, to this very day, I, you know, I'm sure nobody has to, uh, you know, speak too many words to everyone participating and listening today that, you know, uh, black people, uh, you know, cops are murdering them and, you know, everything else going on here, the injustice and abuses and discrimination that's going on, that this has to be part of our overall understanding and, and somehow part of our struggle. And this is internationalism. All right. So, I mean, to me, when we talk about abolition and a world without prisons or police within an internationalist framework, um, I think we have to begin by acknowledging how policing is rooted in protecting the upper class and their commodities, right? Uh, and prison is where you discard any perceived threat to that wealth and status. And, uh, you know, I mean, in some cases, policing in prison is actually the source of that wealth. So as long as society accepts the global system of capitalism as the norm, instead of rejecting its principles as the root of these oppressive institutions, these institutions will not only continue to exist, right, they're going to thrive being fueled by capitalistic greed and discrimination. And the cycle just keeps going on and on and on, right? Extract and exploit, protect and discard. They should have to exploit, protect, and discard, right? Now, this is the legacy of capitalism. And until we begin to resist and dismantle this system on a global scale, there's always going to be oppressive institutions that are in place to maintain this oppressive system. And the system is what actually legitimizes these institutions in a reciprocal and symbiotic relationship. Okay, so so we just we just heard from um, Felix Sitebang, and I just want to say a, a brief sentence about him uh, because we, we didn't uh, he didn't introduce himself. He he jumped right in uh, as is, as is, I think is customary of Felix, um, but he is an organizer and advisor for the Asian Pacific Islander Cultural Awareness Group, uh, and through API CAG. 
which exists throughout Washington uh, prison system. He's organized uh, immigration, social justice, and youth outreach forums and designed Asian American studies courses, an intersectional feminism 101 class, and an anti-domestic violence program. Um, so we heard from Felix, and we also heard from Jan Lahman, who was released uh, just last summer after 37 years inside the federal prison system, uh, and, and is a long time, as you heard, anti-imperialist organizer. Um, so I want to turn it back over to you, Jaleel and Harsha, to, um, to respond to what Felix and Jan gave us about what internationalism means and, and what it sort of requires of us. Go ahead, Asha. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for, for playing those clips, Dan, and for um, having those uh, incredibly powerful insights as, as part of this conversation. Thank you to Felix, thank you to Jan. Um, yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's nothing more that I can say other than, you know, I just strongly concur with what's been said. And I think um, maybe if I can riff off a few things, you know, in terms of the, the point about our theory needing to be relevant to communities and resistance, uh, to folks on the front lines, um, and the concerns, the very legitimate concerns about academia needing to constantly reinvent terminology, that's all very real. Um, I also think, you know, there's different ways of thinking about theory. You know, when I, there are no social movements that have not produced our own theories, that have not produced our own ways of understanding and engaging with the world. And when I think of internationalism, I very much think of the ways in which that is a concept that emerges from communities and resistance, right? Um, internationalism, um, whether it's the reality of uh, so-called diasporic communities, thinking about internationalism because we understand that our lives are interconnected with other parts of the world. Um, and we see that our struggles and our liberation is connected with other parts of the world, right? Like an injury to one is an injury to all, or we see the refractions between domestic and global genocidal warfare, that that is all part of the same system. Um, and of course, you know, this was um, consistently been uh, continuing, but of course, at the height of um, black power and red power movements in the 60s and 70s, you know, that is one of the most inspiring moments, right, is those transnational solidarities and alliances. Um, of how we understand our struggles and our solidarities as bound up, that this is not just a theory, but that we understand the violence of the system is not an aberration, that it is taking place across borders very deliberately and targeting black and brown and indigenous communities and poor communities and oppressed communities. Um, and the other uh, piece that I wanted to think through and very much um, echoing with what was said about, you know, really that the foundation of, of internationalism is to really not create that distinction between the local and the global, right? That again, there are two sides of the same coin. What happens locally happens globally. What happens globally happens locally. And also that what we understand to be the local is in itself a form of international struggle because of um, especially if we're centering indigenous sovereignty, right? That the occupation of these lands means that the, the country that we're in is a settler colonial uh, slave state, right? And that is the history of genocide, of enslavement, of settler, col of settler colonialism and empire. So internationalism has to be understood um, not just as something that's quote unquote over there, but something that is also in these geographies over here. Um, and maybe the, the last thing that I'll that I'll say is um, the piece about um, our resistance needing to be interdependent. And I just really wanted to um, uplift and amplify that, right, that this is in as much as these violences are transnational, resistance is interdependent. And, um, you know, we see that, for example, in resistance to the border wall. Elbit, which is an Israeli company, is operating both at the U.S.-Mexico border and is also op uh, operating in occupied Palestine. So there are, you know, this is just one example of a global movement that is part of the boycott divestment sanctions campaign um, to tackle and to dismantle Elbit systems as part of the Zionist 
um, occupation, or if we look at the ways in which resistance is interdependent from Ferguson to Palestine, right, in fighting against uh, tear gas canisters that the U.S. is employing both here and um, in funding in Palestine, or the drone warfares that, you know, the drone warfare that continues by um, the U.S. government, un including under, under Joe Biden, that is bombing Yemen, for example, and bombing Somalia and bombing Pakistan, that those drones are also being fought in Tadonionan lands, right, whose, whose communities are broken apart by the U.S. border wall and who are fighting militarization and drone surveillance on their, on their communities. So the ways in which, um, in which violence is transnational um, and migrates and moves, um, I think also the ways in which resistance is interdependent um, is a beautiful way of thinking about internationalism um, and thinking about the liberation of, of all peoples. Actually, I really like the way that you uh, explained that, um, that you make those connections between the internationalism and the various fronts uh, of uh, fighting against our, our U.S. imperialism and, uh, and the, the apartheid system of Zionism. It's very good the way you put those things together. However, I, I have to take another approach to this matter. And my approach is this here. That we, uh, when I say we, I'm talking about the American populace, uh, are are guilty of genocides. Uh, we have engaged. We have we have been uh, complicit uh, with the United States engagement of imperialism, both nationally uh, uh, on the international uh, uh, on the international uh, platform, international uh, plane, uh, international arena. And because of that, and for the most part, the international community is waiting for us, the American population, to wake up. Right. Uh, to wake up and find and find their own humanity. One of the things we have lost in the last mm, 500 years is the American populace has lost their humanity. They have been engaged in this process of imperialism, of, of genocides for 500 years. And American population, for the most part, have been complicit. They have been sending their young people to these wars uh, of, of imperialist wars and, and, and adhering to the indoctrination of what the Monroe, the Monroe Doctrine right, and the exceptionalism of the United States. And so therefore, I, in my opinion, in terms of internationalism, we, American population, must become internationalists, right, in understanding our common humanity with the rest of the world. Another thing that we have to look at in terms of this uh, idea of internationalism is the, the philosophy, the aberrant, the aberrant uh, philosophy of white supremacy, right? Uh, I, I think we have to address that issue. Why? Because it is an aberrant philosophy, right? White people, any people who believe that themselves to be superior to any other people on the planet, right, is suffering from a, what I thought was a neurosis, right? It is psychologically uh, an aberration, right? And um, in, in terms of that psychological aberration, I once spoke to a, a, a psychiatrist uh, about that. And I said that, you know, white people are suffering from a trauma from their own trauma of white supremacy, and that they are neurotic in, in their understanding of themselves being superior to any other people on the planet. However, the psychiatrist said no, he corrected me, and she said they're psychotic. I said, what do you mean by psychotic? I said, she said, because of the degree of violence and mass murder that they committed around the world. That's a psychosis, right? And so what we find is that the United States, particularly the United States, and more importantly, white people in the United States are suffering from a psychosis, right? Where they believe that they can, in fact, uh, kill people of color with impunity. Now, the other thing that I want to address is this matter of abolitionists, right? Uh, the abolitionist movement, uh, more often than not, or, or I think that really evolved uh, from uh, uh, Angela Davis when she established the critical resistance. Uh, keep in mind, critical resistance in 1998 was the same year that we organized, or I organized uh, the Jericho movement in support of political prisoners in the same year. But now, today, in my thinking, in regards to what it being, uh, need to be abolished, remember what, what, uh, what, what abolitionists mean is to abolish, to terminate, uh, to put an end to something, right? And in my thinking, we need to put an end to everything that is anti-Black, anti-Brown, anti-Indigenous people. We need to abolish any, everything uh, that is harmful, uh, uh, that grace, dehumanize, and diminishes the value of black, brown, and indigenous people. If it does that, abolish it, right? And white people have to take the front line in doing so. 
and abolish it. Why? Because white supremacy is white people's problem, right? It becomes a black people, brown people, and 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 uh, indigenous people problem when they try to impose that upon us. Then it becomes our problem, and that's why we need to fight back. And so we I need think- to. Tell- yes, 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 uh, Dan. Oh, I was going to say, I think that's a great segue to our next video clip, and then we're going to come back to um, to, to you and, and Harsha for, for more. But I think that, that point about linking critical resistance and Jericho founding is really important. Um, and I know the next video that we're going to hear is Felix and Jan reflecting on prison uh, in, in this context. And sure. so I think I, I want to I want to seize that segue, um, and then we'll come back uh, to you after that. Thank you. questions to me was just like like what like how how attached are we to terms right how um how attached are we to um certain definitions of uh, um you know that 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 like we um give uh these 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 different practices right and how like we're not willing to adapt Right, and not willing to speak the language of others, right? And I'm not talking about like literally language where I'm talking about in a way that people can understand, right? That's the, these, these are things that, that always come up for me when we're talking about abolition work. We're locked up for, for, for so called political crimes or acts against the, the government, you know, things like being charged with sedition, you know, trying to overthrow the government or at least stop them from doing some horrible things like supporting apartheid. But organizing in prison, uh, let me just kind of broadly say this too, and this is this is certainly true, 100% true, for all political prisoners, you know, in captivity right now as well as, you know, going into the past. When, when we, I mean, it's a horrible reality. Anybody in prison will tell you that. Most of the time, the political prisoners are thrown into some of the harshest, worst, most locked down prisons around the country, uh, control units and various horrendous seg units and all that. Uh, but when we went in there, and this is as true for the sisters as it is, is for, the, for, the, for the men in captivity, when we, you know, stepped, you know, were thrown behind those walls, uh, I mean, certainly we had to kind of gain our you know, bearings and see what's what and who's who and all that kind of stuff. But prison and the struggle behind the walls is just another front within the overall struggle or revolutionary, you know, act, you know, reality activism that goes on. It's just another front. Now, it's a, it's a very limiting front and it's a very uh, dangerous front in many ways, but it's just another front. I mean, it's not like any different... Uh, except for, you know, <laughs> day-to-day conditions and realities. But, I mean, the, the work that we do, the organizing that's done, the, the political, you know, education and um, activism and organizing other prisoners, you know, often so-called social prisoners, and, and, and uh, there's often, and more so after, you know, work has been done, there's often, like, uh, you know, uh, politicized revolutionary prisoners you know, and not just political prisoners that are, you know, they're carrying the, you know, the flag and moving forward and organizing other prisoners on on many many levels, uh, education and otherwise. Uh, so that that certainly was my reality for all the 37 years that I was in captivity, and, and when I walked in doing it and I left doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, man, I think, I think, man, there's, there's like a lot of times where, like, you know, I've been, I've been in circles where, like, uh, people come into prisons and they, and, and they come and they, and they, and they give these grand lectures about um, abolition, anti-capitalism, you know, uh, financial literacy, all of, all of this stuff that, you know, I man, they, 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 they come in with these big words, but then, you know. You got someone who's been maybe a gang member his whole life, or has um, been hustling his whole life, or been, been 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 doing whatever it takes to 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 feed his family and also contribute in his 
own way to like his community. Yet because it doesn't look like what these, I don't know, so-called academics come in or, you know, the people with the big names um, like to, uh, I guess, um, uh, have this, you know, project this image of that somehow that's not valid, right? That somehow it's not abolition or mutual aid in practice, right? That somehow you have, like, in order to practice this stuff, you have to fit into a box. And I think that um, a lot of us are not um, um, willing to step outside of our comfort zones and admit that, like, yo, we don't know everything. And I know that, like, uh, people say that a lot, but it's definitely um, it's definitely prevalent in prison when people come in to work with prisoners and say that they want to center the voices of prisoners, yet they already have an idea of what they're trying to, uh, you know, project onto us. And it's no different from, like, old school missionaries showing up to, like, countries back in the day, right, trying to preach this dogma. So, Julia, I wonder if you want to pick up on, on some of the work that you did inside uh, and sort of continue that, um, that conversation that, that Felix and Jan were having. Yeah, I think it's important to understand that in terms of being a political prisoner, that you can always become under, under uh, some degrees of repression, uh, the, under some degrees of surveillance, to some degree of control. And the reason, one of the reasons why is because they don't want that idea of revolution, the idea of liberation, the idea of emancipation to be infecting the prison population, right? To the liberating minds uh, in the prison population. So therefore they have to curtail that. And in so doing, they generally uh, suppress uh, political prisoners and their capacity uh, to become leaders and or advisors and or um, counselors uh, to other prisoners. Uh, they do not like that, do not want that. Uh, because they don't want the, the, the prison population to change from a criminal mentality into a revolutionary mentality. I have a direct experience with that uh, teaching, uh, have been permitted to teach, it was in uh, 2018, been able to teach us in Attica, and was teaching a black history course. And I started in 1861, uh, wow. dealing with civil, civil rights, and came all the way up to um, um, uh, 1966. Uh, when natural 1966, I talked about the Black Panther Party. That was the biggest thing that was jumping off during that period of time. And as I began to talk about the Black Panther Party, uh, they felt that I was trying to change these gangs, bloods, and the Crips from a uh, criminal gangsters into revolutionaries. They put me, in, they put me in solitary confinement for four months. Four months put me in solitary confinement uh, for teaching history, which I had been approved to teach. But it's, it's a matter, more so a matter of changing the mentality from criminal mentality to revolutionary mentality, which they try to suppress inside prisons. And the, therefore, for most part, political prisoners reach the brunt, the brunt of repression uh, in, inside the prison system as across the board. Right? There's, there's no distinction between how they treat us because of our, our politics, more so than anything else, right? who we believe ourselves to be and, and how we act uh, in, and interact uh, with other prisoners. Uh, so that's one of the things that, that Jean uh, had really uh, expressed in regards to how the treatment of political prisoners are across this country. And that's the reason why Jericho was brought into existence, uh, to raise up uh, the idea that political prisoners does in fact exist in the United States, and that's extremely important. Um, so uh, I don't know what much more you want me to say about that. Uh, I can go on and on, of course, uh, but I'll allow uh, uh, someone else need to have the share uh, the podium. I think that 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 was perfect. And you know, one of the things that we want to talk about in talking about internationalism is both the repression of of, uh, of prisons and also the repression of borders and and the things that the kinds of solidarity that borders uh, foreclose or try to foreclose. Um, so why don't we hear from from Jan and Felix uh, on on the concept of borders, and then we'll hear from Harsha.
So internationalism and borders, you know, are, are, are a very immediate and direct issue uh, when we're talking about prisons and prisoners and locking people up and should they, you know, why are they locked up and, uh, you know, because they're undocumented workers over here on this side of the river and on the other side they're, they're, they're not, you know. So I think that's 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 part of it. But overall, more broadly, um, I mean, I I certainly um, support and 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 do what I can in terms of helping other struggles in other countries. You know, dealing with their oppressors and dealing with their injustices and so forth. I mean, uh, you know, as a you know from afar, I certainly support those efforts as I can when I can. But, you know, the world is broken up into these nation states. And so borders are a reality. And how the rulers of the states, you know, and primarily I would say most of the states of the world today are, are run, you know, not for the interests of the of their own public and run by a minority against the interest and, you know, uh, needs of the majority of the people in that country, just like the United States is, maybe in some cases, not as you know harshly as horribly, but but in many similar ways. So borders are a reality. The laws that kind of keep people say you can't go here, you can't go there. Um, from the perspective of of a person, of, of certainly of you know the working class in this country and around the world, certainly just a person in this world, those rules and laws almost, I would say, totally. I mean. I guess one could argue about little areas here and there, are not the interest of us, whether we're standing on this side of the Rio Grande or this side of the, you know, Great Lakes or, you know, wherever we are. Uh, I mean, as far as most of us in the public in all of these countries, these laws and these and these borders are not in our interest, uh, you know, no matter how much, you know, various um, fascistic-type politicians uh, might try to say, you know, that, that this is good for America and America. Oh, this is actually pretty funny, right? This, this is, this is literally coming from a guy that uh, that wakes up <clears throat> every day and sees uh, walls and concrete cages and fences and razor wire, right? But then also, like, I'm able to see. Uh, blue skies and trees, right? And, but knowing that there are invisible borders there as well, right? So like for me, you know, until people have a reliable and consistent way to have their needs met and are able to like feel safe in their community, prisons and borders will always exist, right? There's this illusion that like somehow prison walls and razor wire are what keep the quote unquote bad people contained and the community safe. Right, that that somehow this is the answer to all the society's issues, you know. And um, honestly, it's the same notion when it comes to borders. That as long as there are borders, that the quote unquote bad people are kept at a distance and our community is safe. But what we fail to realize is that it's these very borders that actually act as, as our community's prison walls, right? That we're actually imprisoned in never-ending cycle of greed and exploitation. That these borders are what the rich have constructed to keep us in our place and divided and their assets protected, right? And honestly, like, man, until we're able to acknowledge that our safety and livelihood is not depending on the absence of others, but rather the solidarity of our spirits and resistance, um, people are just going to, you know, people are just going to continue to look towards prison and borders as the answer to all of our fears. So, to me, that's, that's, that's the connection. Harsha, I, I want to just turn that over to you on the connection between prisons and borders that that they were just speaking about. Yeah, that was uh, powerful to listen to again. Um, and I think it was uh, 
comrade Felix in the in the last clip um, describing uh, you know the razor wire and uh, the prison right the, the prison is a border and it reminds me of uh, Angela Davis and Gina Dent when they wrote that the prison is a border uh, drawing on drawing on the experiences of, of incarcerated peoples um, and so that that really I think captures it right which is that the the prison is a border and the border is a prison that they are uh, sites of control of containment um, of oppression and really like immobility right to, to to contain you and immobilize you and I think when we think particularly of the the southern border the US Mexico border um, one of the things that I think uh, we don't often remember but I think it's so such a useful trajectory into the function of the border um, is that you know even before border patrol was formalized some of the first vigilantes at the border um, particularly in, in at that time, you know, as, as Texas uh, was annexed and captured um, by by the U.S. Um, through U.S. conquest, you know, in 1850, when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, some of the first vigilantes at the border um, were at the border in order to ensure that black people could not escape into Mexico. Right. So the border was functioning to control and contain people within the so-called border right within um, within enslavement. And we have to remember that, that the border is not just to keep people out, it's also to contain people. When we think about migrant workers or undocumented uh, undocumented workers, the U.S. is, you know, the largest carceral prison state in the world. It has the capacity to detain and deport every undocumented migrant if it wanted to. But of course it doesn't because it relies on that exploitable cheap labor, right? It creates the condition of deportability without actually deporting all people. So creating that fear um, and using deportation and union busting and termination together to keep um, to keep people immobilized and precarious. And I think there's, um, in terms of internationalism and abolition, for me, borders really are at that, they're like that linchpin, right? Between how do we control people how do we create a population that is constantly displaced? That's through imperialism, as Jaleel, you pointed out so poignantly, right? The U.S. is uh, is complicit in mass imperialism at a global scale today, not just historically, but ongoing. And people are increasingly forced to move. And then when they move, they face these militarized borders. And I think we also have to keep in mind that the border is not... Um, it's not a site of militarization for all people, right? Like we're also in an era while thousands and thousands of people are dying at the border. There's also the 1% who are, you know, proximate, who have power, who are rich, who are white, um, who have access to Western passports, who can travel all around the world, who are literally columbusing around the world, who are extracting, who are mining, who are polluting, who are bombing. Um, who are traveling all around the world on their, you know, business class visas or whatever. Um, so this, the crisis of the border is is not for everybody, right? Which is the reality of all carceral systems. The police, the prisons, the military, and the borders are intended to inflict violence on certain populations while um, ensure the continued domination by others. And so that's also the reality of borders and borders really prop up. Maybe this is my last point. I'd say they prop up global apartheid today, right? Like what is one of the main ways in which the so-called difference between the global South and the global North continues to exist today? One of the many ways is through citizenship, right? The luck of where you were born will determine your access to how you're going to live, whether you can get a vaccine in today's era, whether you're going to be able to access that um, in an era of global vaccine apartheid. So it's certainly not the only one, um, but I think borders are a key pillar of, of maintaining racial citizenship and racial empire in, in the world today. And so abolition absolutely must include the dismantling of borders because it's fundamental to dismantling capitalism and imperialism.
Thank you so so much, Harsha. I think that just uh, yeah, my mind is is, is expanding with, with these amazing connections that everyone is making. Um, I know we have one more video from Jan and Felix, uh, and so I, I want to to hear from them on their takeaways, and then we can come back for um, comments from from Jaleel and Harsha and uh, and questions from the audience. Honestly, like what makes me optimistic is youth organizing and leadership. You know, I've I've had the privilege of working with some super dope young folk out of Seattle and also in prison that have not only like taken a stand against oppression but have invested in their future and the future of this community, right? Like they've taken the opportunity to educate themselves and like truly embody the lessons of generations before them in a way that makes sense to them, right? And if anything, you know, this is another example of abolition being great, right? Efficient, life affirming, sustainable, right? True power in the people. Um, what concerns me is this new age of like non-profiteers, right? Like the non-profits that wear our clothes, speak our language, but ultimately whose funding relies on our prison. You know, these nonprofits that claim to be about the people yet are tied to the very institutions and systems that are in place to keep us in our chains. Right? These these um, these folk that come and and and, and with, with 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 profits in mind um, and practice this respectability politics rather than truly empowering the people to speak. Right and, and and voice what truly matters to them. Um, you know, I've had I've had experiences where I've worked with uh, folk from different nonprofits that come in with this with this with this grand idea of you know we're here to 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 be an ally, right? While we're looking for accomplices um, that 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 are willing to only push so far as long as it doesn't take away from their funding and their access. And that's what concerns me, is that when people come in from the community representing these nonprofits, um, that, you know, um, it's a smoke and mirrors that organizers on the inside start to rely on them for support. And, um, you know, all of a sudden, man, we're, 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 we are we are now tied to the institutions and systems, right? And 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 um, I'm not saying that all nonprofits and people that work for nonprofits are bad, because there's a lot of bomb work going on that I love and support, and there's a lot of great people that I know. I'm just saying that um, we sh we need to be more mindful and intentional about uh, understanding who we are aligning ourselves with. Because not everybody has the best intentions, and that's what concerns me. And also, it kind of uh, ties into like the concerns, right? Uh, the lady told us, you know, all of us are out here, certainly myself included, uh, at, you know, struggling, you know, week by week, month, year by year, some decade by decade, right? And oftentimes, you know, we're pushing the same things and. And, 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 you know, it, it's like an uphill battle, you know, all that, too. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind, struggle brings results. And just recently, in the last few weeks, I, I want to I bring out a few examples. About three weeks ago, there was an international tribunal that was organized. It took a long time to organize an event. It was an international tribunal of international judges that were uh, had uh, 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 a multiple-day uh, kind of like a trial with lots of tremendous um, testimony and so forth about the U.S. Uh, state and government, um, you know, committing genocide and crimes against uh, black people, natives, all people of color within this country. The tribunal came back after hearing days and days of testimony and ruled that, in fact, the United States government was guilty of exactly those things. Now, 
obviously the U.S. government is not going to say, okay, we're guilty, so, you know, how can we, you know, rectify it or who do we have to pay or whatever. But the fact is this is an international tribunal that carries the weight of international law, speaking of international again, of international law, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, it can have follow-up impact, like people can take things to the U.N. People, there's actually uh, uh, statutes within the U.S.A. law that people could file and sue the government under based upon this, you know, uh, ruling that was that came down. The day that ended, that was on a, on a Sunday. The next day, Monday, uh, probably a lot of people are familiar with the Maroon, Russell Maroon Schultz, a long, long time held political prisoner who was very ill. In fact, he's, you know, extremely ill. But after decades and decades of, of captivity, he was released on Monday. Now, he was released for because he was so ill and released for uh, medical reasons, but he's in the arms and embrace of his family and, and, and people that love him now. The following day, Tuesday, David Gilbert, long, long held, 40-something year held political prisoner up in New York State, went to the parole board and was granted parole. And actually he was released uh, just recently, last week or something like that. So it just goes to show you that like struggle brings results. And, and we should never get, like, too discouraged because, you know, we can't push a certain thing that's so important to be pushed. Um, um. Well, what a wonderful way to wrap up with this idea that, uh, or this reminder, this encouragement that struggle brings results. Um, and Jaleel, you were intimately involved in that uh, tribunal. Um, so I'd love to hear hear from you. Uh, any sort of closing remarks as we move towards finishing? Um, but, but just before you speak, I just want to remind everyone that we do still have time for questions if, uh, if you put them in the chat. Thank, thank you, Dan. First of all, I want to uh, thank Harsha for her succinct and poignant explanation of borders. It was very well, very well stated. And it's important for us to understand that borders for the most part, and I'm, I'm going to have to be a little bit uh, critical of us, our borders are artificial, right? We create our own borders. When we created borders uh, are dividing us uh, um, as people uh, in our own humanity, uh, we have created borders uh, in, in this kind of uh, uh, social order that has been created by U.S. imperialism for the most part and white supremacy. Right? We've created borders uh, within our own relationship that we have with, with each other as people on this planet, as species on this planet. Uh, and it's important for us to rise up above that in our own common, learning our own common humanity. Uh, I don't know where we are with that and, and, uh, or how far we need to go in, in getting to that point, uh, but that's part of our struggle as well. Uh, in becoming a new man, a new woman, what we say revolutionaries, all right? Um, now, in regards to the, the genocides, um, the, the verdict by the international jurors and the genocide uh, convention or the tribunal, uh, I was in, again, I, I made mention I was put in uh, solitary confinement for four months for teaching a class. While I was in solitary confinement, this is in 2018, I decided about a proposal that the international jurors return to the United States. They had been here in, in 1981, and the campaign had organized uh, to get uh, 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 international jurors to the United States. Uh, to investigate the existence of political prisoners. And uh, uh, Jericho and various other organizations took my proposal and we created the International Tribunal. Uh, that was started in 2000, uh, that was started 2018. It didn't resol it resolve into a international tribunal until 2020. And the uh, international jurists, nine international jurists from around the world uh, declared the United States was indeed uh, guilty of a uh, commission of, uh, of genocides. Uh, the the areas where they raised was uh, killing the killing of, of people, black, brown, and indigenous people, the mass incarceration of black, brown, and indigenous people, of political prisoners and their existence in the United States, environmental racism, and health uh, health inequities uh, within the United States. Uh, that, that all of it collectively uh, created conditions that one can consider to be genocidal. Um, the first time the genocide was brought to uh, United into the United Nations was in. Uh, December 17th, 1951, two months after I was born by the great Paul Robeson and William Patterson. And what we have done was succeeded in what they attempted to do back in 1951. We actually got a verdict. 
And our next move now is to file a petition in, in the United States Supreme United States uh, District Court uh, with the charge of genocide based upon violation of 18 U.S.C. 1091. That is the treaty by which the United States has signed on to the, to, to the International Convention on Genocides. And so for us, moving forward, by our struggle, a uh, human rights struggle, is that anything that diminishes, degrades, and, and devalues black people on across the board, whether it's dealing with, with uh, uh, environmental issues, health issues, uh, um, um, police killings, mass incarceration, we are saying that they are engaging in the process of genocide. Right? Uh, we're not no longer holding this uh, idea uh, that we're fighting for civil rights. Right? Uh, that we're fighting for uh, uh, to be included within the system of imperialism. Uh, we are now fighting for independence. Right? And our golden objective is ensure that the new narrative, the new narrative in America, is that anything that diminishes, degrades, and dehumanizes Black, Brown, and Indigenous people is kind of under the rubric of genocide. Right, that's the new narrative that we're going to move forward. And so it is important for us to understand uh, this new narrative and, and building an ideal uh, a movement that addresses the issues of genocide uh, and how we are going to uh, actually ensure that people around the world understand that what's going on in the United States is a question of us fighting against genocide, right, to save our own selves. Uh, now, I'm going to make one, one two, two other points right quick, if, if I may. Right, one in terms of internationalism is that if, in fact, um, um, uh, we are building an international uh, uh, fight, right, then it's important that the people around the world who has been waiting for American people to rise up, right, because of their own compli complicity with the United States imperialism, right, that we have to re recognize that we in the United States, in the belly of the beast, are the vanguard, right. And then, therefore, the people uh, uh, fighting against imperialism around the world are the rear guard in this fight. Right? We have to come to that understanding. If we are the tip of the spear in this struggle, then the international community is the shaft of that spear. So it's important for us to turn inward right, and recognize that our struggle and our fight is not only saving ourselves, but it's saving all people around the world against this, uh, against this, uh, this bloody uh, purveyor of violence, as Dr. Martin Luther King has stated, uh, that the United States is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Right? We need to stop it. We need to. We need to end this. Right? This this bloodlust of the United States and its imperialism. Right? And if we don't do it, it's not going to get done. Asha, you want to uh, share on that? Yes, thank you. I'm just waiting for the interpreter switch. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Jaleel. And also again to Jan and Felix. That's just, it's just such an honor um, and listening and thinking alongside you. Um, and absolutely agree. I mean, I think in the context of uh, internationalism, we have to center imperialism. It's impossible to have a conversation about internationalism without contending with this immense reality of uh, the United States as the greatest purveyor of violence. Um, and I also appreciate very much and you know, wholeheartedly agree about the narrative um, that has to shift from one um, of civil rights or assimilation. And that's certainly true in the context of the immigrant rights movement, right? Where the mainstream immigrants rights movement for a long time has very much focused on integration and assimilation in a way that ignores the reality of imperialism, that upholds this myth of multiculturalism, that ignores settler colonialism, that often ignores enslavement as the foundational reality, right? So what does it mean to integrate or assimilate into settler colonialism, enslavement, and imperialism? That's not the narrative. That's not acceptable. And so instead, we need a much more robust anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist orientation um, to understand that, you know, migration itself is an internationalist phenomenon. It's not about just the border over here. Um, it very much is about what's happening all around the world. Um, and also, I just wanted to um, add one more thing, Af Jaleel, after you spoke, it also reminded me that, you know, one of the other ways in which the border works um, is to create, you know, those divisions, right? And then it becomes easier to scapegoat, you know, when we're on the shop floor, when we're in our neighborhoods, 
it becomes very easy to scapegoat the undocumented worker, the migrant worker for supposedly stealing our jobs, stealing our resources. And the enemy becomes, you know, the person who came on a boat instead of the guy who's driving the limo, instead of the boss, instead of our government. Um, and that's also, um, you know, the function of the border and part of internationalist struggle is exactly, as you said, breaking down those borders that divide us. Um, maybe the other takeaway that I was uh, thinking on is, you know, Dan, you opened up um, with Ruthie Gilmore's invocation about abolitionist presence. And in hearing Jan and Felix in a few of their clips, you know, really talking about the ways in which those who are not incarcerated enter into this work, um, the savior mentality, the nonprofit industrial complex, you know, all of that, um, how important it is as part of abolitionist work to also challenge those structures, right? Like when movements become complicit in liberalism, when movements are tied to funders who are co-opting our movements, um, when academia, you know, gentrifies social movements or claims, you know, having invented something like all of that is part of what we have to be skeptical about. Um, and I think especially there's a lot there. And of course, that's a whole nother um, but necessary conversation. But I think in particular, one thing that nonprofits do um, is really to like silo our issues, right? Like a nonprofit's whole mandate is like we work on one thing. Um, and we know that abolition and really the revolutionary horizon, right? Revolution means dismantling everything. And Jalil, as you put it, right? Everything that degrades and dehumanizes and perpetuates genocide. That's not about a single issue. That's dismantling this whole corrupt system. Um, and so when we're entering into this work, we can't just be fighting single issues. All, you know, that can't be our mandate. That's not a revolutionary mandate. Um, you know, we really need to be meeting people where they're at and understanding that it's all of this, you know, like you pointed out, it's the healthcare system, it's the police, uh, it's prisons, it's the border, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the shop floor, it's the boss, it's the banker, it's the military, it's all of it. Um, and that, you know, that is the struggle, right? That is the struggle. Um, and I really also just want to echo, you know, struggle, struggle brings victory. If we don't fight, we don't win. That's just the reality. If we don't fight, there is no chance of winning. When we fight, we build collective power. When we fight, we build our our, uh, our capacity to dream, our capacity to believe in our and to strengthen our political imagination and to really build with each other, right? That's also part of what capitalism wants us to do is believe that there's no other alternative, to believe that we're going to live as isolated atoms for the rest of our lives. Um, and so part of that muscle is our collective muscle to constantly dream and to constantly fight as Mariam Kaba reminds us, hope is a discipline. Um, and only when we struggle do we do we even have the possibility of winning. And more often than not, we do. We win. And so I also um, wanted to emphasize uh, and echo and affirm um, that takeaway from the clip as well. And I, and I, let me make just one, one little brief uh, comment, right, uh, in regards to our system or this system of imperialism, of capitalist imperialism. Um, I have a, a group of young people in my house and a uh, study group, right? And so I, I got a Lexus. And some people say, man, you, know, you shouldn't have a Lexus in there. That's a made of data mining. But anyway, I asked Alexa, I said, how many billionaires are in the United States? And Alexa responded, 500, mm, 544 billionaires in the United States. Then I asked Alexa, well, how much is the accumulated wealth of these billionaires in the United States? She said, $6.2999 trillion, trillion dollars. All the wealth of Western Europe all the wealth of Western Europe is accumulated in, in the controls of 544 people in the United States. We have a population of 330 million people. And the, and the, and the country is controlled by 544 billionaires. That's a disconnect in our own mentality, in our own thinking, in our own our association with one another and who controls what. Right, and we're fighting for the crumbs, fighting for the crumbs. That's insanity. That's insanity. And we don't understand that, that they, 544 people, about 28,000 families, controls the majority of the wealth of this country. And we're fighting over pennants off the crumbs off their table. Come on, people. Come on, people. That's ridiculous. 544 people controls the wealth of this country. 330 million people and we fighting over what huh and and it's due to what capitalism divide and conquer 
right? Individualism, individualism, and what? Competition. And so what we need to change the narrative from individualism to collectivity, right? And from competition to cooperation. Those are two principles going to fight against capitalist imperialism, all right? Uh, individualism and uh, competition, cooperation and collectivity. Right? That's what we need, began to voice that idea across the board. And, and when we say abolitionists, right, abolish everything that's anti-people, right? The anti-humanity, our common humanity, it needs to be abolished, all right? And so this is the idea that I think we need to be, begin to have a new narrative of what it means to be governed, to be, what it means to be governed, right? And also keep in mind, go to 28 USC 3002-15A and read what it says. It says that the United States is what? A federal corporation, all right? So in, in essence, what we're saying is that we are citizens of a corporation. We are corporate citizens. Do we understand that, all right? And so this is also important in our thinking of how we are living as a people. The United States Supreme Court stated in the, under the case of Hobby Lobby, what that corporations are what? People. So when they say we the people, who are they talking about? They're talking about corporations. They're not talking about sentient human beings. Sentient human beings are the means by which the corporations reach exorbitant profits, right? Wage, wage slavery, right? And for the most part. And that's the reason why we're divided into classes and understanding the capitalist system. So it's extremely important for us to understand some of the dynamics, the interworkings of the system, how it operates, right? And we are complicit in imperialism. We have blood on our hands, right? The American population has blood on their hands from all around the world. And the world is waiting for us to get our act together, right? Because when we free ourselves, we free in the world. We take that burden. We have to take that burden because we created the conditions that exist in the world today, right? We are complicit in that. All right. And so for us, um, it is extremely important that we understand that at this point in time, and in this, in this system of governing, right, is a system of government of plutocracy, right? A system of government where a minority of billionaires control the wealth of this country and we're having us fighting over the crumbs. We don't understand the big picture. We need to look at this thing more, a little bit more deeply. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jaleel uh, and, and Harsha. This evening has been so wonderful. I think we just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, and so I want to see if either one of you had any, um, anything you wanted to, to draw viewers' attention to uh, about projects that you're working on uh, or uh, a website they could go to for more. Uh, and then we'll wrap up. Yes, uh, I, I'd like to share, uh, please go to uh, uh, spiritofmandela.org, uh, right, uh, and learn about the, the movement that we're moving forward with, uh, with the, uh, uh, after the, the genocidic uh, international tribunal. Uh, we will begin a process of organizing 2022, a people's senate. Right? The reason why we're building a people's senate is because we need to divorce ourselves from both the Democratic and the Republican Party. We have to create a new narrative of what it means to be governed in, in this social order. Right. And so the people's center is going to be equivalent to a united front, building towards a united front. So we can have a new, like I said before, a new narrative and how we uh, look upon our, ourselves and how we engage in struggle uh, to free ourselves from this, this corporate uh, uh, governing uh, that we have allow ourselves to be governed by. And so the people's center is our next move going in 2022. Uh, go to spiritofmandela.org and learn more about what we're doing. Thank you so much. Uh, Harsha, is there anything that you want to shout out? Not in particular. Um, I'd okay. want to shout out a lot and then I would miss something. So sure. I just I just want to say thank you truly for organizing this and thank you to the interpreters for sticking with us and, and my apologies for my fast pace. I realize I'm probably speaking really fast. Um, but yeah, Comrade Jaleel and, and Diana, uh, did I pronounce their name right? Jana and Felix? Jan. Yeah, Jana. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's been an honor and it's just, uh, I'm so blessed to, to learn alongside.
Yeah, well, th thank you all so much for joining us this evening. This was such a wonderful way to wrap up this fall uh, 2021 study and struggle series uh, by talking and thinking together inside the walls and outside about abolition, the ways it must be read, green, intersectional, and international. Uh, if people have, want more information about study and struggle, they can check out the website, studyandstruggle.com. I'm sure we'll be back next year, uh, but you can see the curriculum that we've been using this year and, uh, and the one that we used last year as well. And I want to just, again, uh, reiterate my thanks to, to Jaleel, to Harsha, to Felix, to Jan, uh, to everyone interpreting and captioning and making these events come off as wonderfully as they have. So thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to your, your, your listening and your, your viewing audience. It is extremely important that we have these, uh, these forums so we can share these ideas uh, going forward. Uh, this system has to be abolished, period.